I'm Brad Carter. I'm the chief pilot here at the Owl's Head Transportation Museum. Where is that located? In Owl's Head, Maine, which is near Rockland on the coast. The airplane was destined for an around the world uh, competition, trying to fly around the world and win a prize. Um, it never did that. It got shipped to uh, Halifax. Uh, supposedly the destination was Vancouver, and it was going to be the third plane in a series of Fokker C4s used to fly around the world. Uh, this one stayed in its crate for quite a while. The uh, around the world attempt failed with an earlier airplane and an earlier leg, and it never quite got anywhere. So then it was rescued from its crate a few years later uh, by a Mr. Osborne apparently, and used for um, his attempt to go around the world. He started putting together a, a syndicate to do that, and that just failed, uh, never went anywhere, um, and was eventually purchased by Bob Wark and Eddie, whose last name escapes me. Brown. Brown? I think I'd know that one. That would be an easy one to remember. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Bob and Eddie bought it and used it, hoping to start an airline business. Uh, I guess that sort of worked. We have a picture of uh, Clara Bow next to this airplane. Oh, wow. And uh, she's talking with Bob Wark, and we would actually, uh, when we got the plane flying here... Uh, I have to ask you before, so uh, when did you start flying here? When did I start flying here? Yeah. Uh, 1998. Okay. Uh, and Attempt to do something with it, but... It crash yeah. somewhere. Bob and Eddie, after deciding the uh, uh, airline wasn't a viable concept for them, attempted to use this to fly to Vancouver and they redid the interior with uh, a fuel tank and put a second cockpit in the back. The pilot sits up top if you can't tell from this angle. Um, and then uh, took off. The plumbing on the fuel tank wasn't quite right and they had to land out of gas with a full tank. Uh, so, uh, and they did successfully. Um, and then I guess they knocked the landing gear off somehow in an attempt to get it to another field that was bigger. I'm not sure which. Uh, and there it sat for the next 50 years uh, until Kenshin Chet rescued it. Who, uh, who rescued it? Kenshin Chet. He was a trustee here at the museum and he flew the uh, Fokker uh, DR1 for many years. And is he Mike still Fox, around? He is 90-something years old now, and yes, very much alive. Uh, still in Maine, but uh, he doesn't spend much time here anymore. Okay, tell us about flying it. Uh, well, flying it, you have a big crew. It takes six of us to get it off that little wheel dolly after we get it taxied out or started. Actually, before we start it. Um, we'll roll it out and then... Uh, Three people on each side lifting and another guy pulling, or sometimes we do it with five. Then uh, uh, you scurry up into the cockpit, which is in itself a painful process. It's not easy. When uh, you're up there, we have another crew of people. We'll take two or three, usually, for the crank where that hole is in front of the radiator. And the crank cranks, and the engine turns over very slowly. Um, and the guy in the cockpit's cranking a magneto to give us a shower of sparks. And that uh, eventually gets it to light. And then it rumbles a lot. It sounds like a box of rocks. It's just always rumbling. And it's not exhaust. It's gears. and it, uh, oh. it's, a, it's quite a noise. Um, but it's a good air engine. It, it's it, a uh, Rolls-Royce, right? Rolls-Royce Eagle 8, which is a 12-cylinder. Um, predecessor to the Merlin in the Mustang. I mean, you, this is the grandfather here. It was used as a bomber engine in World War I on the uh, Vickers Dimmy. This is the only currently flying Rolls-Royce engine, Eagle 8 engine, in the world. This is the only currently flying, this is the only actually uh, left Fokker C4 in the world. So there's no, no others. Um, and at one time there were a couple hundred built, um, more than that. And they were used by uh, several different militaries. At there we go. You can't see any of the things that are different in the cockpit. But it does have a, uh, a retard level for the ignition timing. You can take the camera away. Yeah. All right. It's, it's actually recording right now. Don't worry, I'll cut out the Well, that 
So over there, and it's dark, we have the uh, lever for run and start, vice versa actually. So when we try and start it, we push it up here, then we run it, it goes down like that. The stick is a big giant thing, as well as the rudder pedals. What is the engine anyway? It's a Rolls-Royce Eagle 8 12 cylinder. I guess the British like the understatement because they call it an 8, but it's a 12 cylinder. So it's got four mags. Did it originally have that in it then? Yeah, this one did. Uh, and again, this was built in Holland after the war. Right. So let's see if I got a flashlight in here. <laughs> All right, so over there is our lever for uh, spark advance. Put it in the start mode to uh, start, and then we put it in the run mode afterwards. We got two fuel levers. One's in op. The other one is off right now, and that's to just the one fuel tank. Antique altimeter. Modern airspeed. Reads 60 miles an hour regardless of what you're doing once it's running. <laughs> and the RPM, we actually run this uh, somewhere around 12 to 1400 RPM, 1450 is about its max. Two mag switches, temp and oil pressure. Down here, this is an un interesting feature, it's a crank for the radiators. Uh, yeah, let me see if I can shine light on it while I do it. The radiators crank in. We almost never do that unless we're starting the airplane. And then we crank them back up. Well, no. <laughs> That's the way they did it anyway. Uh, down here is the uh, mag that I crank when we start it. So I'm sitting up here with my mags on everything set and cranking away on this thing and another guy's down below cranking away on the big crank to make the engine turn over. That's the trim lever. There's 44 turns of trim so you start off at 22 to, for takeoff. So you wind it all the way one way and then back 22. Over here is the throttle and mixture. The mixture's on the bottom on this one which is nice. But I'll show you something kind of interesting. I wish I had three hands for the light. Um, let's see. Yeah, that works. So with the throttle retarded, that's all good. Mixture full forward like it is right now. But if you go to shut the airplane off with the mixture, watch the top lever. It goes to half throttle. So if you taxi up to park it, and don't think it through and go to shut it off with the mixture. He lets me do it all the time. Don't, yeah. He works here. Oh. Do you want to try and get up in this plane? I don't think so. The, uh, we, we don't anymore. They did in the 20s. So, so that throttle advances as you're shutting the engine off and your handle, your hand is on the wrong handle. So even if you push it back to full rich, you've got your throttle halfway advanced. And then the rudder pedals have two settings, one for shorter and taller people, and it's a bar like the old airplanes had. And that's about all there is in the cockpit. It's roomy, no doubt about that. And you got a compass out here and uh, the view along the front that's the there's a radiator tank in the upper wing and that's what we're looking at with those pipes and then our fuel gauges and fuel pipe and then just cabanes and you have wires to turn it back and forth when you taxi out what's that you have to s turn back and forth uh, actually i take the crew with me <laughs> and you do a little bit when you're free taxiing but most of the time you got the crew that's helping to uh, ensure you go the right 
It looks so comfortable. Huh? <laughs> and at one time there were a couple hundred built, um, more than that, and they were used by uh, several different militaries as a two-seat observation plane. Uh, I think you might be able to take some pictures out of that book and yeah. edit them in. It seems like it would be hard to see anything out of it, though, with that lower wing, unless there's a big uh, cutout. The, the lower wing's far enough back that you can see forward this way. Um, when we have to taxi to the cross runway, I've got to go between two uh, runway lights. And you've got really to get pretty close before you can tell where they are. Um, you, you don't have good vision that way. But so so uh, taking off, how do you take it off? Um, well, you run it up, the radiators are out, and uh, you advance the power slowly to full power. The uh, airplane moves slowly, so don't rush to get the tail up because you want to get tail authority first. Then when the tail comes up, it's actually pretty nice. It, it handles nicely. Uh, it comes off the ground very quickly after that and climbs up at a pretty good angle. Unfortunately, the airspeed indicator in this will read around 60 miles an hour while you're climbing out. Then it'll read 60 miles an hour when you're flying level. And then it'll read 60 miles an hour when you're descending. <laughs> so, is that, but is the airplane actually changing speeds or it just? Yes, yes. At, at different times, I felt that I was actually going 110 miles an hour. Uh, it's at 130 on that thing down below. It might be, but it's reading 60. <laughs> <laughs> so. So well, uh, I remember when you a few years ago when you talked you were talking about the DR1. You know what was the speed it landed at, and you said comes over the fence at 80, and I said is that miles per hour or kilometers? And maybe I don't know. Still don't know. <laughs> I don't know. The, uh, this one, like the DR1, has no cross bracing in between. Fokker was pretty good about cleaning up his airplanes, so this one comes into uh, uh, the approach to land is much more like a modern Cessna with no flaps on. Um, because it, it does come down pretty good. And you end up slipping this one quite a bit if you want to get down on a particular spot. Now, what, how about, the, is there a, a, an adverse yaw problem, and how do you taxi it around on the ground? I have a guy out here on the wings. It is so oh. heavy that it takes one or two guys to hold right here to turn it around. Okay. And they will be pushed and, and rolled over. There's a lot of power here, but it's a lot of weight, too. And is, uh, how about the, the rudder? Do you have to uh, use a lot of rudder with it? Not particularly. No, it's not bad that way. And everybody else actually likes flying this airplane more than I do. The, the other people who fly it, they all feel it flies like a Piper Cub. I feel um, um, it's very heavy, and if it wants to go away, you've got to be cautious about that when it yeah. comes into land. On takeoff, it's good. Flying, pretty good. And you basically just fly around the pattern. You don't go anywhere with it, really. We have gone you know, little excursions to do camera trips and photo, oh, really? photo ops, but um, not very many. Oh. So mostly it's left turns, and it does them fairly well. Oh, cool. So, uh, it's it's the star of the, you know, call them air shows, you call them flight demonstrations. Flight demonstrations, absolutely. <laughs> so. I guess that's about enough, what do you think? Sure.